I'm beginning to form relationships with fashion houses because now they see the value because we're the pulse. We are what's hot. We're creating trends. We're spending money. And now everyone wants to work with us. It's my responsibility as a professor to really let them know who the originators are because I just feel as if like there's no one that's really doing that. Hi, this is Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of The Business of Fashion. Welcome to the BOF podcast. It's Friday, September 3rd. American stylist and fashion designer Misa Hilton rose to prominence in the 1990s for her work with hip hop and R&B legends such as Lil' Kim, and Mary J. Blige. She played a major role in bridging fashion and hip hop, but Hilton hasn't received her due credit for her lasting impact on fashion trends. This week on the BOF podcast, BOF columnist Jason Campbell is joined by Hilton and Nick Nelson, an adjunct professor at the New School who teaches a course on fashion styling to discuss Hilton's life and work, as well as the enduring significance of hip hop culture and fashion. Here's Misa Hilton and Nick Nelson, Inside Fashion. Well, this is a conversation I've been wanting to have, and I'm so glad that you're joining this conversation, Nick, because I think you will add a different dimension um, to this. But we want to dive into me. So this is this is about you. This is about your contribution to fashion. This is about your long experience in this industry, a story that's not not always known. So I would like to be a part of the telling of this story. And Misa, I was working in this industry during the time of your rise. I witnessed the delicate dance between fashion and hip-hop and I remember I remember when the fashion industry treated hip-hop like a pariah yes but as we know that has all changed (laughs) (laughs) hip-hop dominates hip-hop dominates popular culture and its influence is evident and irrefutable but Misa I I was shocked when I floated your name among some of my fashion diehards and Mm -hmm. you're recognition was low in certain circles that I, to be perfectly honest, it should not be in, which for me only reinforces the need to have this conversation in this forum. And my through line for this conversation, Misa, is that Misa is is um, <laughs> is hip hop culture, essentially. And hip hop culture has been the dominant musical and style genre for the last three decades. And you are the architect of that enduring style. That's a big platform to sit on. And I want you to dissect all of this for me. Let's start from the beginning. Oftentimes, Misa, when the story is told about um, us Black people foraying into fashion and the world of style, it doesn't necessarily speak to the incredible style that is in our community, that is in our everyday life. Tell me about those early influences Mm -hmm. um, before um, arriving in the fashion world. Yeah, my early influences included my cultural background. Uh, My mother is Japanese and Jamaican West Indian, and my father is Black African American. And so um, I grew up with a lot of culture influence. Um, I grew up, you know, seeing things through a different lens than what was happening outside of my home, if that makes sense. So I had um, Japanese culture in my maternal grandmother's home. Um, I would wear kimonos around the house. I would do origami. Um, I would then go to Jamaica for the summers and you know, be immersed in that culture. And on the weekends, I would go to my dad's house. And he lived in East Orange, New Jersey. And that's where I got some great hip hop memories and hip hop culture um, from those moments where I could be immersed in hip hop fully. My my maternal um, side of the family was a little conservative. And so I would sort of be able to let loose when I went to dad's house on the weekends. And so um, as far as style, Um, coming from a stylish family, um, I would say not so much. Um, I have one fancy aunt. We all have one. (laughs) We do, we do. You know, the aunt who's going to come through with the Saks Fifth Avenue boxes on Christmas and the rabbit coats. And she was a uh, a Pan Am airline stewardess and she was so fab. And mostly my mother and my aunts 
and my uncle who were a part of my immediate environment, um, they were all into um, engineering, science, mathematics. There wasn't too much concern about style. And so here I come along, this young, creative, little whippersnapper into the family. And um, I was just making my own creativity. And so the first place that I was able to express that creativity was on my body. So as early as five years old, I would be changing my clothes several times a day, getting in trouble for making laundry and a mess, but that was my creativity being born. I would change my outfits and my hairstyle based on mood, what I was watching on a television, or uh, whatever was going on at that time in my life. And that was the first place that I got to work with image. It was on my body. And, you know, the energy would change and I'm like, oh, time to change my clothes, you know, wardrobe change. And it was just something that was innate and inside of me and very natural. Fashion wasn't something that was discussed um, in my immediate family. And I'm not sure if they even knew that that would be a career. I mean, they most certainly wouldn't have taken anything like that seriously. But fate would have it where I would be at the right place at the right time where my natural gifts would be needed. And that's how I started my career in fashion by hanging out with Sean Combs, who I was dating at the time at Uptown Records under the tutelage of Andre Harrell. And so that's basically um, the short story from about five years old to 17. You're from a family of engineers and doctors and people who construct and do things. And yes. I want to sort of like, you know, sort of dovetail into your DIY, <laughs> your DIY yes. construction on your physical self when you were younger. Yes. Moving yes. on from your physical exper experiment on your physical selves and then moving on to those early days of hip hop where your creativity was sort of unleashed. Tell me mm -hmm. about how you went from experimenting on yourself to going to Lita Kim or, or Jodeci for mm -hmm. that matter. Mm -hmm. Well, there actually was a step before I made it to the celebrity world and that step was styling my friends and the people that were around me. And I would uh, make custom pieces for myself, whether I was going to Jones Beach Greek picnic, I would like custom design my own bathing suit. Um, I would also uh, create prom dresses for my friends, um, design them and go to a local seamstress to bring them to life. Um, I would, <laughs> cut design and color hair with no license, but I was excellent at it. My my um my glam squad family, uh, the hairstylists always laugh at me because they're like, you think you're a hairstylist. I'm like, I know how to do hair. I know how to do color. I know how to cut. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that was a place where I could, you know, practice my creativity. And I always loved hair. My fashion styling hair has always been a a, a big focal point um, in my styling. Um, but yeah, so I would style my friends and family and I had clients and I would do their hair and make extra money um, on the weekends as a side job. And that's how I got practice in understanding people, understanding um, their natural sense of style and how to bring that out as well as how to um, deal with clients basically, and how to see the best in people and how to bring out their assets. Because as soon as I look at someone, I see everything great about them. And that's just how I see people and how I see the world. You say you see everything great about them, but you also, I th you also see them in a particular, <laughs> in a particular wardrobe, <laughs> you yeah. know, in the, in the, <laughs> in the documentary. Yes. I was so struck by this point where, you, you know, when you saw whatever musical act, you said that you were styling them in your head. You were envisioning what yes. these artists would be wearing. Why was the imaging of such important motivation for you? You know, I would have to, uh, the only credit I could give is to God blessing with this gift to, you know, I would hear music, I would hear the sound, I would hear the lyrics and the melodies and the harmony. And I thought wardrobe, that just inspired me to think wardrobe, imaging, and look something that would accompany a sound, if that makes sense, a fashion story to go with what I, would hear or what I was hearing. 
it must have been quite a reveal for you to a have this impetus to want to restyle people, and then you have the opportunity. Then you you meet the opportunity to actually image these these musical acts and celebrities and so forth. It seemed like yes. it was quite a Christmas was quite a Christmas moment. <laughs> I had no idea what a fashion stylist was and that I could even become one. And so hanging out with Puff at Uptown, I was there, I was his right hand. And um, he had just went from intern to a &R and had become responsible for Jodeci's project um, from sound and putting the album together as well as their look. And so I was there and we would share ideas and I would be his backup to support a lot of the ideas that he wanted to bring to life. And um, when it was time for the first music video, Gotta Love for Jodeci, um, I was able to assist on that project. But before we even got to um, the video, we had to convince Andre Harrell that this new look that we wanted to introduce um, we had to we had to convince him to allow us to do it. And um, at that time, R and B singers dressed up and they wore hard bottom shoes and suits mostly. And it was this thing like, if you're going to be on TV or if you're going to be seen, you should be like dressed up. And we wanted to represent for the youth and youth culture and show our style, you know, and show some of the cool things that we were wearing and that we were into. Um, even though that they were singing love songs, um, we thought that it would be cool to dress them like rappers, you know, to dress them in hoodies and um, combat boots and, and baseball caps to the back and leather. So there was a rock element in there as well. Misa, mm -hmm. I want to pause you there because I, sure. I want the audience to really understand what Misa is talking about. She is talking about streetwear. She's talking about <laughs> when <laughs> this is what <laughs> this is what we call streetwear. This is what we call the multi-billion dollar industry. This is when um, you moved from stage wear, essentially your Sunday's best suit that is uniform in the group, and you go on stage and you croon. That that paradigm was changed yes. by putting them essentially in streetwear to perform on stage. And so, um, you know, after about two hours, Andre finally agreed to let us go forward with this new look. And, um, you know, the rest is history as far as that's concerned. Um, it was a hit. I was at the cusp of music changing, fashion changing, the sound of music changing, the hip hop and R&B sound was being birthed. Yeah. And so I was right there and uh, my natural talents and style aesthetic and boldness and courage to, you know, really believe in what I was creating. It worked for me and, and it stood out and it was something different and it was, um, it was fresh and it was youthful and it was current and it was trendsetting. Yeah. It, it, it was really a magical moment in hindsight because wow. I had no idea what was happening. I was just in the moment, totally immersed in it. I want you to take us back to the moment when fashion was just starting to embrace hip hop and 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 more about your role in that. And I want to sort of dive into Little Kim because in my in my recall, um, Little Kim was such an integral um, part of the visibility. So I want to understand mm -hmm. where did Kim meet um, and how far you pushed the envelope with her, how much of the ideas was hers, how much was yours, and how did her small size sort of advance that creative collaboration? Because, you know, with, with challenges like that, I would think that, you know, some ingenuity would come about. And was Little Kim really the beginning of the forging of that true relationship with hip hop and fashion houses? I would have to say, backtrack a bit to the queen, Miss Mary J. Blige. And she set the tone, although she was a singer, she loved hip hop. We both loved hip hop. Um, and when we met, Andre wanted to introduce us. She, he, he thought that we would be a good fit and that we could work well together because we were both from Westchester. And Westchester is its own little bubble. It's like 
you know, so close to the Bronx, so close to Harlem, but at the same time, it's the suburbs. So you get like the best of both worlds. You get urban and suburban. And so we understood each other completely. Um, and she loved hip hop. And although she was a singer, it was sort of the same thing. She wasn't about to put on a gown. She, you know, she wasn't um, going to have the same style as Whitney Houston or Mariah Carey or go in that direction. She wanted to be true to who she was. And um, I, I noticed that immediately. And so we incorporated a lot of hip hop style into her styling work. And, you know, she came out, her first album was a smash, her style, you know, so many young girls related to it in the inner city and in the hoods. And it was really powerful because of that, because we were now able to see ourselves and see our style in the forefront on TV. And so those images and those moments reached artists like Little Kim, you know, who at that time, she probably had not thought about becoming an artist yet. You know, but she was influenced by Mary J. Blige and empowered by Mary J. Blige's style. So um, by the time um, we had all reached a level of success, um, I had now gone from working under the Uptown umbrella to uh, to every record company calling me to style. You know, so I've you know I've worked with almost every artist and the hip hop and R and B lane, at least one time. I want to um, to interrogate the that period between Mary and sure. Little Kim. I, I think that's a very important. And Nick, this is where I would like to bring um, you in in this conversation, uh, and because uh, it was a very important styling decision that you made with Mary J. Blige. And a lot of this is illustrated in the documentary, Misa, in that, you know, initially yes. she came out with more masculine styling. That was what she was more comfortable with, was a part of her armor. But then that gradually changed. A feminization, um, a feminization started taking place. It started taking place with Mary. And then by the time with Lita Kim, it was something completely, uh, it was it was full feminine. So Nick, yes. your, your, <laughs> yes. course, your course covers this area of feminization that, that, that I'm about to delve into. But tell us about your observation on the theme as it relates to Misa's styling. I think it's important now more than ever that my students, you know, who will be the next fashion stylists, fashion photographers, and fashion designers are able to demonstrate an ability to, you know, like decode the concepts behind images and understand the implications of these images. And I cite Misa's work, particularly with Lil' Kim, as an example when I lecture on sex and feminization and how that can be weaponized mm -hmm. styl stylistically. You know, oftentimes, mm -hmm. as we know, when women occupy male-dominated spaces, the natural inclination is usually to follow the paradigm that exists, which usually results in them sort of acquiescing. And what's extraordinary about Misa's work is that she has consistently gone against the paradigm, you know, which has allowed my students and I to have really insightful discussions on, on patriarchy and agency. And, you know, which begs the question, you know, for me, so I'm just curious, like how much were you and little Kim in the creative driving seat? And were there any like men in the background dictating any of these choices, any a &Rs or managers? Or were you guys solely doing this together? And were you even thinking about sort of like, you know, female empowerment and owning sexuality? Or was it just simply just two girls having fun with the clothes? Well, no, we weren't thinking about that um, at all. And I think that's the beautiful thing about it, that we didn't overthink anything. So there was no fear and there was no limitations and there were no boxes. Just by listening to what she's saying, it provoked us to want to highlight femininity and sexuality and to do it with intention and creativity and I guess courage in a lot of ways, because, you know, up until then, the founding mothers of hip hop, you know, as you said, they had to go toe to toe with the guys. So they wanted to be just as tough and they didn't want to be looked at, at or sexualized in that way because they want they were 
be, you know, they wanted to battle with the best of them, the best mm -hmm. of the guys and be seen as equals. And so because they laid that foundation um, and solidified that female rappers were indeed talented, powerful, valuable, and a huge part of, you know, the hip hop culture, Kim was then able to stand on their foundation and open up a different lane. And as women, we should be able to express ourselves in any way that we want to, you know, whether it is tomboy or tomboy chic, or if it is celebrating sexuality, which is a form of power. And so she, that was a moment where we were able to do that. What were the barriers, or did you have any barriers uh, that you faced as a Black stylist with a uh, a new cadre of talent um, at that time? Where Did you have any issues in infiltrating the business and getting clothes and, and um, collaborating? You did. Break that down Absolutely. a bit. Absolutely. When I started working with Mary, it was virtually impossible to pull clothes or to forge relationships with fashion houses because they didn't see any value with working with us. Um, we were young Black talent. Um, and women. And so um, it, it was virtually impossible to, to get through to them and to create relationships. But I always say where there's an obstacle, there's an opportunity. And that was when I put on my designer cap, cap and began to design custom looks for my clients, which included Kim. I mean, which included Kim later on down the line, but okay, so that's from Mary. And now when we fast forward to Kim, by that time, I'm established as a fashion stylist. I'm beginning to form relationships with uh, fashion houses because now they see the value because we're the pulse. We are what's hot. We're creating trends. We're spending money and now everyone wants to work with us. Now we are eight, we are being invited to Milan, to the Versace show, Fashion Week, forget about it, we're front row, um, invited to all of the luxury fashion house events, whether it was fashion shows or, or private parties. I think that's important as well to, to outline, Misa, to state that in fact, the industry did not, <laughs> they did not usher in, they did not fully usher in, um, you know, this whole new cadre of, um, of talent. And in fact, let's be honest, fashion was really looking at the hip hop movement with their noses in the ear. It wasn't style that was particularly credited. It was um, in your face. It was, you know, logo driven. It was really yes. sort of brassy and brash. And from the fashion, the sort of core fashion side, that wasn't really, that was not really embraced. However, what did you think when brands like Chanel, Tommy Hilfiger, and others started to appropriate the hip hop styles in their own design? And remember, that came in quick succession. That didn't take yes. years to materialize. They were like, oh, all of a sudden Chanel is like, you know, there's gold that's flinging everywhere, not in their traditional right. way, but in a, in a very hip hop style. In fact, when I saw some of those images, Misa, I got to say, I cringed a little bit. I cringed at the yeah. cultural really cultural appropriation, if you if you want to call yes. it that. What did you think about that? And were you, did they engage you to consult on those collections, those hip hop collections? No, I, I mean, I, one word can sum it up what I was thinking. Wow. Wow. That's what I used to say. Wow. I didn't let it bring me down again. It felt like there was nothing I could do about it anyway. You know, at that time, like, who am I in the big world of fashion and what, you know, what am I going to do? Go to Chanel and, and to the creative director and complain. You know what I mean? There's no recourse. Our fashion um, aesthetic was just, you know, it was being appropriated. But we continue to do what we do and to push forward. Um, and there were some cases where they would engage us. Like I said, they would invite us to the shows. And sometimes I would see the outfits that we had on in the next year's collection, whether it was colorways or specific styles or the way that we put things together or, or any of the custom pieces that I was creating, I would see something similar later on. But again, it just didn't feel like it was anything that we could do about it. Um, and so we just continue to press on and continue to do what we do. I know I was not 
um, ever asked until recently to come into any luxury fashion house and create or any photo shoot that was in a high end fashion magazine. No, I wasn't invited to style it, but our style was being emulated, even so much so that sometimes my clients would have these opportunities, but they wouldn't be allowed to bring their stylist who created this fashion um, and created their look that they love so much. And then they would have a white stylist come in and pretty much emulate what we were doing. And the best case scenarios, I would be able to be an, a consultant on set if my clients really fought for me. Oh, wow. Nick, we're in a very different time. You know, we're, we, we ask for everyone to be vocal. We ask for people to stand for something. That comes with the territory as fashion professionals now. But are your students aware of this kind of history, for example, that Misa endured as it relates to having access and so forth? And cultural yeah. appreciation. They, they yeah. are aware that, that this history was lived. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of my lectures that I do in Inside Fashion Styling is to, to give examples of cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation and also giving them a blueprint of where these things come from. You know, I remember years ago when I had a sis when I was working on jobs and I remember my assistants were just, you know, so enamored with Lady Gaga and like, her thinking that it was so genius. And I would say, oh, well, do you guys know about Grace Jones and Lee Bowery? Mm. You know, people like mm -hmm. Nina Hagen and LaBelle. Mm -hmm. And they didn't mm -hmm. know about these people, you know? And so this was a huge impetus for me to do my course. I mean, I do a lecture on the cultural significance of Grace Jones. And I'm always baffled that here I am at a prestigious art school and no one knows who Grace Jones is, you know? So I think whether it's Grace Jones, whether it's bringing in Misa, it's my responsibility as a professor to really let them know who the originators are, because I just feel as if like there's no one that's really doing that. And their eyes just like light up because they don't know about Grace and Lee Bowery and, and what Misa did. I mean, even just watching the remix, I was blown away about the whole Jodeci thing, you know what I mean? And how that changed from like the sort of like the temptations and, you know, Black sort of R&B singer is supposed to be so presentable and so proper and to see the, to know the history behind that. I mean, I'm even learning. So I think this is incredibly important for this new young generation of creators to actually know that it didn't start with the Lady Gagas of the world. Let's just take that in and reflect on what has transpired in the last 40 years in hip hop and R&B influence on global style consumption you know i want to be very yes. clear here that we're not just talking about oh my god there was some cool little situation that was put out we're talking about consumption artists are the ultimate fashion influencers and your blueprint is all over today's style do you observe culture do you observe the culture and think of the billions in purchases that you've had a hand in influences and and, and it, truly though and let's talk about some of those enduring let's talk about those enduring trends let's talk about logos for the masses just to be clear i want to make sure this is underscore what we're speaking about here what the, where the influences are logos for the masses streetwear as luxury monochromatic looks and colored hair, chunky gold jewelry accessories and all of it, all of those kind of things that, you know, it's very much a natural part of our styling world, but at one time it simply was not. And it required change makers like yourself to um, to enact those change. So this is, a, <laughs> this is a really important point of reflection. Now, <laughs> where do you sit with the luxury brands that did not market to our community during this period, um, Misa? And, and, and when did that change, do you think? I see the most recent changes, I would say in the last five years, maybe. Like, you know, not it, it hasn't been that long. It really hasn't. Um, and how I feel about them not marketing to us or celebrating us or including us in the time before. Um, I feel like it was, it was 
unfortunate for them because they lost out, you know, at that time. And they began to catch on. Um, and first it was because of the money and the excitement and the energy that we generated. And now we're finally at a point where I think these brands and corporations are beginning to approach being more real about engaging us and what that looks like and what diversity looks like, what inclusion looks like, um, how to really support us and not just drain us and milk us dry for all of our creativity and for what we can do for them as far as, you know, financially. Um, creativity, of course, you know, it's the money initially that we were able to um, generate that got them interested and made them turn their heads. And even in those moments in the beginning, we were still marginalized in those opportunities. We still um, weren't celebrated um, in the most appropriate ways. But I think now we're at a time in the world where so many things are changing and so many systems are being rebuilt. And so is it always um, 100% authentic in the way that we're engaged now? Absolutely not. But it's a start. And there are some brands like MCM who are authentic um, in celebrating um, hip hop culture in particular and highlighting people like myself. They actually funded the remix film. So I want to speak uh, about MCM, and this is a great time to do so. And MCM Misa is your current, um, it's your current gig, let's say. You're the co global creative partner um, at MCM. I believe you've been there for five years. And yes. I want to, but I want to go back. <laughs> I want to go okay. back, you know, because um, I think MCM is sort of one of these brands that is not fully, fully understood. And I, I know for sure it's not really understood how important this brand is for our culture. I'm going to take you back to the 80s when MCM stood mm -hmm. for making cash money. Money. M okay. <laughs> MCM was the label of money. You wear MCM yes. accessories with lotto shoes. It was yes. all about the money. So I want to make it very clear to the audience out there. So for the Black community, MCM, I know that there are other logo-driven companies, LVMH and other mm -hmm. and, and so forth out there. But L L um, MCM holds a very, 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 very special place. And I love how the acronym, you know, was, was, yes. um, was, um, you know, um, morphed to suit our yes. community. So right. tell me about, you know, MCM, certainly give us a little bit of history on that and also your current work with them. And also mm -hmm. you were diving into how MCM, the brand served the black community. I, I would like to know how they serve the black community, considering that they have such a long history in it and have changed hands from German ownership to Korean ownership and so forth. So let's let's break down. Let's break that down. Well, let's start with um, the fact that MCM was actually the go-to brand in pocketbook and the most popular even before Gucci and LVMH um, and Louis Vuitton um, initially. Like they were considered, you know luxury, especially in our communities. And um, so with that fact, when you go back to the 80s, um, you see MCM is like a staple. I mean, growing up, my aunties had MCM bags and I couldn't wait to get my hands on one. That's what I saw. And of course, the Gucci's and, and Louis Vuitton's came later, but it was definitely a staple in hip hop fashion and black fashion. And so to fast forward to now, um, and, and I agree with you, MCM isn't always understood. Um, they're very boutique, but the heritage is unbelievable. Their desire to be in tune and in alignment with um, fashion that's outside of the box, um, not having a desire to um, be inauthentic to who they are, even though it may you know, take them into a different level where people may know them a bit more. They stay true to their roots and what they believe in under the leadership of Miss Kim, who's an amazing, she's the owner now, and she's amazing powerhouse of a woman. And she's a woman of color being a, a Korean woman. And we connected, um, you know, on an Asian level, as well as um, an empowered woman level. and. Um, 
you know, it, and as far as what they do to support um, Black creators, I mean, just look at the film. What Fashion House has done a film that has highlighted um, unsung heroes in fashion and people who have not um, had certain opportunities or have not been celebrated in fashion. And so that speaks volumes that they would fund a film that highlights individuals such as myself, April Walker, um, Dapper Dan, Kirby Jean Raymond. Um, yeah. And so it, just having that opportunity to, you know, be in the film was like, it, it was a gift from God, honestly, because so many people who did not know my contributions now know. And um, I'm very modest. And so I'm not one to go out and say, oh, I started that or, oh, that trend. I did that in the 90s or, you know, I, I created this or, you know, the, the clients and, and the artists that I work with, we were doing those styles that and we were doing street where I'm not going to go out with a bullhorn. Um, and, <laughs> you <may>. you <laughs> and probably <broadcast>. should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just not me. I, I'm just, I love to create, you know, at my mm -hmm. core. So as long as I can create it, I'm happy. You know, that's my passion. And I'm just a true creative and a behind the scenes type person. And so also being a part of that film was very different for me to share my story in front of the camera because I'm always behind the camera working for the person in front of the camera. And so sharing my story, was it was empowering. You know, it, it was a, a wonderful opportunity to share my story um, and, and what I had done to contribute to, um, the, to fashion and to the culture. And so many opportunities came forth from that moment. And so, you know, that was all made possible through the MCM opportunity. And uh, once we, I, I met uh, uh, Rita at um, MCM, she was a VP there at the time. Um, she immediately said, welcome me into the MCM fashion house on a creative level. So not only were they documenting my work, but they gave me an opportunity to create for the fashion house. And I'll never forget the first day she invited me up and I had a meeting with um, uh, the creative director at the time and they opened up the archives for me to create whatever I wanted for them. And the first opportunity that I had to create for them was an event they had for their collaboration with Puma. It was an MCM Puma collab. And I created custom looks for Rhapsody, Ninth Wonder, Big, and Big Daddy Kane. And the rest was history. And I always knew if I could ever get my foot in that door, that's all I would need, that they would love me and I would be there to stay. And so MCM's very close to my heart for that opportunity to not only, you know, to, to share my story, but also to create, which is what I love best. And I have to say, you have created some, um, some iconic moments in this age from beyond, in MCM clothing and accessories, that is, you know, from Beyonce's yes. Ain't Shit video to Meg The Stallion to Missy Elliott to the City Girls and so forth. Like, you're really seeing some very iconic um, images of MCM in this era on Black talents. So that's yes. really wonderful. Tell me about your styling to me. You've also opened uh, an enemy here in New York um, over the last few years. What What's your intention with that? Yes. Yeah, so I founded the Misa Hilton Fashion Academy, also known as MHFA in 2012. So next year will be our 10th year. And I decided that I wanted to you know, educate the next generation of fashion creatives. And it started as a fashion styling program because I saw a need for people who look like me to be educated, mentored, and um, provided a safe space to create and to be authentic and to be free um, and to understand their gifts better. Um, personal development is a big part of the educational process at the academy. And, you know, it was imperative that I gave back in that way. I had achieved so much success and I saw that there were many creatives who would either not get opportunities or they would get opportunities and not know how to um, 
leverage them and not know how to scale once they got their foot in the door. And um, and remember, there was an influx of fashion stylists, I believe, like in the early 2000s. It was like everybody was a stylist all of a sudden. It was like, oh, I can put a cute outfit together at the mall. I'm a stylist. <laughs> or there would be artists even that would have a stylish cousin. And now the cousins are st- their stylists. You know what I mean? But they didn't have any understanding. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's opportunity. And we should put each other on. But you have to understand the business of fashion styling and and of fashion and the culture of it. Um, And then you need to be mentored. As a person of color, it's not easy to be in these spaces. It's not easy when the challenges come up and um, the disparity wreaks its ugly head. How do you handle these situations and these moments and continue to excel and to continue to work in excellence and stay motivated and focused on your goals? Um, so yeah, for me, education is imperative as well as um, mentorship and having people who support you, who believe in you, and who are going to help you get to that next level. And personal development is key. We can't, you know, self awareness, personal development, um, choosing to become a better person and to develop yourself into who you want to be is also something that is key in success. And finally, what do you think about all of these youngins who are literally discovering all of your contribution to this industry and like and embracing it and rehashing it and so forth? What do you think think about that? I think it's awesome. I think it's wonderful. Um, When I see um, reinterpretations of my work or my work emulated, I'm always you know, excited and thrilled about it. I welcome it. I think it's amazing. Who knew that a little girl from Mount Vernon could have such an impact on fashion? You know what I mean? I'm not trained at Parsons. I have no formal fashion education. I have hands-on experience and grit and blood, sweat, and tears and an entrepreneurial spirit in mind. And that's what got me to where I am today. So um, just knowing the road that I took, the road less traveled in, in, in many cases, and having to sort of create this lane that didn't exist. And there were so many, you know, challenges and trials and tribulations, as well as happy, exciting, iconic moments in that journey. And so when I see that, um, it makes me happy to know that that is something that I created that has so much power and effect on people that they would choose to want to gravitate towards it. That is absolutely wonderful. Misa, on that note, I am so grateful for your time today. It's just really, really illuminating. I, I learned from this exchange. <laughs> Nick, Thank you so much for joining us today and for your insights on this subject. And Misa, I'm, I'm no doubt you'll be having more conversations about your contribution because they are enduring and lasting. And um, I hope credit will continue to go your way. So thank you so thank much again. You. I greatly appreciate it. Nick, thank you. Thank and thank you. you, Nick, for including me in your educational history of Black creators. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, Don't forget to subscribe to the BOF podcast for our look inside fashion and how it connects to currents in the wider world. If you're not yet a BOF professional member, join today with our 30-day risk-free trial and benefit from exclusive access to agenda-setting analysis you won't find anywhere else. The BOF podcast is edited and produced by Emma Clark, Kate Bartan, and Kevin Bobby Blanco in the BOF studio team.